right. Now, I hope I don't get too lopsided sometimes in my preaching. There's certain things that just interest me quite a bit. And this is one of those topics. And I'm going to be dealing with the, the, the title of my sermon is, is False Witnesses. But uh, just kind of taking a step back here, I want you to keep your place in Deuteronomy 19 because we're going to come back to it. But just flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 4. God's system is amazing. It's perfect. It doesn't need to be improved upon. See, unfortunately, we live in, a, you know, in, a, in the world, and the world always thinks they could improve on what God does. They're always trying to improve on nature. They're always trying to improve in any area of God's creation and thinking that they could always just do better than God. And always, when they, when they go messing around with things they shouldn't mess, mess around with, end up making unintended consequences. But I digress. What we need more of, what what Christians need to understand more and what definitely this, this country needs to understand more is just how great God's criminal justice system really is and how much better served we would be if we could institute laws and a government that would mimic what God gave to Israel. Because God's truths, the, the laws, I mentioned this this morning, I was talking about that this morning, I was preaching out the Old Testament, his laws stand. God is, the, God is the lawgiver. God is the judge. We understand right from wrong because of God. The, even reason, the, reason, the only reason you even have a sense of right and wrong and you have a conscience is because God gave that to you. You know, people want to be able to use their own intuition to determine right from wrong without recognizing, hey, God's the one that gave that to you to begin with. And that's just an intuition. That's just to help us out along the way. But he's given us in black and white rules and laws and, and judgments uh, 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 that will, um, you know, penalties for sin or for crimes that ought to be paid out and that would be righteous and just in order for, for um, justice to prevail. So we see this spelled out here in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land, whether you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What's he saying here? You know, Deuteronomy is basically the second giving of the law. The law has already been given once. Now Deuteronomy is kind of just repeating and giving the law again. And he's saying, you know, if you can just keep this law that God's given us, if we could keep this, all the other countries are going to see and hear and just be like, wow, what a, what a wise country to have such great laws, laws that make so much sense. What a great country. It's got, you're going you're gonna to stand up as a model, as an example of, hey, look at their crime rate. Hey, look at, you know, look at the, the, the health and the wealth of the people there. Look at how happy people are living there because you're going to have a proper justice system that's going to, look, no justice system is ever going to completely eliminate all crime or transgression. There's always sinners. There's always going to be sinners. But the way that you deal with sinners makes a big difference in how much crime is going to happen as a result. I mean, when there's, when there's no punishment for crimes, they're just going to abound. There has to be consequences for actions. Now, um, let's keep reading here. It says, verse 7, For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. So he's saying this law is, is so important. You need to be diligent. You need to take heed lest you forget these things. You need to take heed to teach them unto your children, unto your grandchildren. Make sure that this, this truth, this great law doesn't get lost. 
that people don't just go around and just end up changing it because this is good for you. Now, what we have today is a bunch of people that want to mock God's word, a bunch of wicked people that want to mock and ridicule. Oh, you believe the, oh, you, you think, and it is what they'll always say things like, so you think a disobedient child should be put to death? Yeah, that's in God's law. And, and they want to judge God. First and foremost, they're standing in their own judgment seat, judging God, the creator, the God that gives them breath and life. They're judging the righteousness of God, let alone they're, they're doing it falsely anyways, because they're just repeating something they've heard some other hater of God say without actually fact-checking what the Bible actually really is talking about. Now, I'm not going to get off into that topic tonight. I've done it plenty of other times explaining what that means, but... Let's look at some examples in God's law. And turn, turn forward, if you would, just to Deuteronomy chapter 22. We're coming back to Deuteronomy 19, but we started off at, as I was reading Deuteronomy 22 this morning for this morning's sermon, this just kind of popped in my head, like, wow, what a great example, especially for what I'm preaching tonight about God's law and how perfect God's law is and how, you know, there's, there's all these, even like checks and balances and catches within God's law that will help account for things. And, uh, and I'll explain what I mean in just a minute. Let's, let's just reread this portion I read this morning, starting in chapter tw or verse 23 of chapter 22. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So basically, and if you read through the whole chapter, as we did this morning, you'll see, there's other instances being laid out there. And what this is referring to is adultery, essentially, because the Bible puts a death sentence on adulterers and adulteresses. If you're, if you're sleeping around with somebody that's married, then both of you are put to death. Boy, what would that do to divorce rates or to, a, you know, just divorce rates in this country? I mean, how many divorces happen as a result of adultery? When... You're thinking, you know, you're, you're starting that relationship with somebody before things actually get out of hand, but then you got in the back of your mind, you know, if I get caught, I'm going to be put to death. That's a little bit more serious than, well, worst case scenario, I just leave my wife or leave my husband, right? I mean, that's kind of what's going on in people's heads. You see it all the time on TV. It's no big deal. Everybody's doing it. As opposed to God's law saying, yeah, you're going to, you want to, you want to, just completely destroy the trust and, and, and just abhor your vow that you made unto your, your spouse, then God's gonna, God says you're gonna, you deserve the death penalty. You deserve to be put to death for that. You can't maintain your fidelity to your spouse. That's serious. And, you know, people today might be like, oh, that's not righteous. That's not, well, then you're judging God. And as I said this morning, I don't think, you know, we know that God doesn't change. If God, God hasn't like softened up on sin in the New Testament, by the way, if he thought that this was a proper punishment in Deuteronomy, he still thinks it's a proper punishment for human government today too, because that's what he's doing in Leviticus and Exodus and Deuteronomy when he's given the law. What is it? It's for human government. That's the purpose. And people want to say, oh, yeah, but we're all sinners, so shouldn't we all just be put to death? Oh, for the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death, so we should all die, right? It's the stupidest argument. No, there's a difference between God judging our soul for eternity and accepting the, the payment that Christ made for our sins, which is hell, by the way. All, any sin that you commit has a, a punishment of hell that you need to be paid for, but... That is not exactly the same as human government. See, God has different institutions. He's got the family, he's got church, and there's civil government. There's human government to, 
to be executing justice on the evildoers. It's necessary. It needs to happen. So in this passage, we have this example of, of a virgin. She's betrothed unto an husband, so she's married. And it's giving different locations for a reason because what they're establishing here is intent, right? Whether or not a man forces a woman or not. Because if a man forces a person, he's supposed to be put to death also. It's a real rapist. And that's what it says here. So she's like, hey, if they're out in a field, you, you, and, and see what the assumption is that she did cry out. If a man takes a woman in the field, forces her, there's no witnesses around because it was just off in the middle of nowhere. The assumption is that, well, she screamed and there was no one there to help her out, so he's getting put to death. But if they get found in a city, if this gets this found heaven, she's not screaming, she's not you know, calling for help and crying out, then the assumption is, well, she must be part to it, you know, willingly. Which is when they both get put to death. Now, the reason why I say God's word is perfect, because think about this. People might say, yeah, but what, what if he says, I'll kill you if you scream, right? I mean, that, that's kind of a natural thing. So, well, what if, what if he says, oh, you know, I put the knife, don't kill me. Well, you're going to be put to death if you don't scream. If that's the law, which it is in God's law, why wouldn't a woman scream? They say, well, I mean, maybe he'll, put, maybe he'll kill me, maybe he won't. I don't know what he's going to do for sure. But if I don't scream and someone comes in, then I'm definitely being put to death. And what does that do to a potential attacker if you know that your victim is going to scream? It's kind of like potential victims... You know, in going in an area where there's, where there's a whole armed populace or more, way more people that are, that are, you know, armed and, you know, maybe concealed carry, there's a lot less likelihood of someone targeting just, just at random, you know, to rob or mug or, you know, whatever, when they think that that person might be able to fight back. And it's going to be a similar thing. You know, the, these predators, they look for the easiest mark, the easiest target, someone who's going to not cause problems for them, but they can just do what they want and be done with it and not get caught. But when it's built into God's law that, hey, she, she better scream because that's the only way they're gonna, people are going to know that she, this isn't willful on her part. And people just grow up with that. I mean, I teach my daughters that. Uh, and, and, and you know what? Even the statistics, you know, if you look at crimes, and stuff, they, they always tell you, don't ever just go willingly with someone who's trying to kidnap you or anything like that because you're probably going to end up dead. That's what the stats say. You have a much better chance of getting out of the situation before you even get into it than anything else. So I tell my daughter, you know, if someone's trying to take you, I say, you scream, you kick, you bite, you do all this stuff because that's going to be your best chance. And even if they say, if you say anything, I'll kill you or I'll kill your mom or your dad or, you know, you do it anyways. You don't listen to them. And this is, this is a truth that even the world will tell you that that's true. That statistically speaking, you are better off doing that than going with somebody to just go, fa go, go get abused even more and be tortured more and killed more likely than, than just screaming right where you're at. But see, God's law already had that figured out thousands of years ago. God doesn't need statistics to understand his creation, people that he created. He knows. He knows how to handle these things. Keep your place still in Deuteronomy because we're coming back to it, but flip over real quick to Leviticus chapter 20. We're going to briefly look through this list of, of different sins that God does place a death penalty on. Now, this isn't comprehensive. It's just one of the easiest places to turn to that have a lot, of, a lot of crimes. I keep on saying sins, which, I mean, the Bible uses that word sins, but I want to try to make sure I'm very clear here. We're not, obviously, not every single sin that a person commits is a crime. I mean, it's a crime against the Lord, but not every sin that a person commits is a crime punishable by civil government, or it shouldn't be, at least. For example, the Bible talks about you know, drunkenness being a sin. But there's no law in God's human government law of someone, okay, you got drunk, so now you have to pay some fine or you get beat or whatever. That's not in there. 
So I'm trying to be careful. I'm referring to crimes. If I'm saying the word sin, I'm referring to crimes because the Bible also here will use the word sin in that same sense. Leviticus chapter 20, look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. And remember, we already read in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he's saying, look, if you can keep these laws and do these commandments, I mean, into the sight of all the nations, you'll be seen as wise, and this is going to be great for your nation, and, and wow, what a, wise country, what, what a wise nation is this to have these type of laws in, intact. You know what we are now? We're, we're a joke. We're a mockery, a laughing stock, because we let perverts and pedophiles out of jail with barely a slap on the wrist. Instead of recognizing that they're brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. I mean, how, what, what else shows such a lack of understanding than when people can do the most perverted thing that, that could ever possibly come to mind? You're just letting them go back out. Oh, okay, here, we'll put you in a cell for a little while. Then you just go back out on the street. This guy that sold a plant is going to be in prison longer than this guy who, who molested some child and defiled them and ruined their life forever. It's disgusting and it's just twisted and perverted and God help us. God help us to get back to a righteous judgment on just weirdo perverts like that. They ought to be executed. Yet this stupid sinful world just Oh, no, we're going to fix it. We'll rehabilitate them. Or, you know, it's not that big of a deal. I don't know what they, I don't even know where they come up with justification for these sentences that they give them. Because these child molesters, these, these predators, they keep going back anyways. They keep on getting caught. It doesn't matter what you do to them. They're going to keep doing it. Watch that film, Psychopath Reprobates. It explains a lot. Because it also explains the child molester. They can't stop. They won't stop. Out of their own mouths, you'll hear it. You can watch some of these documentaries that they have on people in prison and stuff. Sometimes they'll talk to these pedophiles and it's just like they just keep getting caught over and over again. I was watching one, I don't know, a few weeks ago and it was just like this guy just kept on having this, this child porn in his, in his cell. In jail. I mean, a guy's in jail already and he just keeps getting caught with this stuff within the prison. Why? Because he can't help himself because he's a stinking reprobate. God's given him over to a reprobate mind. There's nothing you can do to fix that person other than putting a bullet in their brain. And you know what? We'll see in God's law the same thing. Leviticus chapter 20, look at verse number 9. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. And again, people will mock this. But you know what? When people mock this, when people look at the Bible and, and want to scoff at that, oh believer, oh Christian, don't you back down from God's word. Don't you be ashamed of what God said. You ought to defend God's word and not let people just, just pounce all over you or, or don't let that make you ashamed on what the Bible says is a, is a righteous judgment. Even if you don't understand it. But these things aren't really that hard to understand. Just because we live in a wicked society where kids are growing up, there is an evil and adulterous generation that curseth father and mother, as the Bible says. Just because we may be living in a time where these generations are rising up that want to curse their father and mother and think it's not that big of a deal, God says it is a big deal. You ought to respect, you ought to honor your father and mother, the Bible says in the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, read it. The Bible says here in verse number nine, for everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. That's a death penalty. And what's a curse? A curse is the opposite of a blessing. The, I think the best example of a curse, I like to say, is go, you know, go to hell. I hope you die and go to hell. That's a curse. Because hell is a curse. It's a condemnation and you want someone to go there, that is a curse, as opposed to, hey, God bless you, I hope you, you know, God blesses you with, with finances or health or whatever, right? It's, that's, that's all it is, it's pretty simple. But that's the amount of respect that God demands for children to have for their parents. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon, 
to him. It's their fault. Now, one thing you have to understand and notice with God's law, too, this isn't talking about five-year-olds. It never is. It's not talking about some little, little child. You know, people say, you know, there's, there's, I think we'll get into in this list where, you know, if a, if a child smites their parents, that means they're hit, they hit them, right? It's not talking about the, the, the one-year-old that's going, uh, uh, goo, 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 uh, uh, and, and is like slapping you. That's not what it's talking about. They're like, no, you don't put them to death for that. But that's just common sense. I mean, I, I mean, some of that stuff doesn't even, it doesn't even need to be written in God's law because it's, it's just so stupid if you think that that's what it's talking about. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. You may be looking at these things and going, I didn't know that was that bad. Well, you need to get in the Bible more. Because yes, it is that bad. Yes, it is weird. And if God says that there's a death penalty, then that's what it, that's what it deserves. And we need to look at that. And, and if we're caught up and in, in just getting brainwashed by our society, we need, we need to get a brain cleansing from the Word of God. And, and get ourselves straight and say, no, that, that is really wicked and really bizarre, and that should never happen. Verse number 13, if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Talking about the homos. Yes, that is a death penalty crime for two sodomites to lay together. Verse number 14, and if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And that is a wicked thing. I mean, how weird is that? Verse number 15, and if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and he shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach on any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. Thou shalt, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. All these laws, you know, if we had these laws in place, there would still be crime. There would still be sin. But it would be a much, much more pleasant place to live in. This stuff is serious. Now, with all of these various things, now, this does, and, and if you think about it, though, this still doesn't affect some huge majority of people at all. It's, it's actually be a really small minority that any of these laws would impact to begin with. So why are people get so freaked out and upset about having a death penalty for these things? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, we're, we're literally talking about like 2% of the population that would even fall into this category. I mean, most people, and most criminals even, don't fall into these categories where you just deserve the death penalty because you're doing some weird, wicked thing. But that little, that little percentage can cause, can, can spread tons of wickedness by allowing them to just continue and persist and, and, and stay alive. It's, a, it's like a cancer. A little leaven leavened with the whole lump. And these, this is some really wicked leaven that just needs to be stamped out. Now, we're in, you go back, if you would, to um, Deuteronomy 19, because we're going to be, you know, I wanted to kind of just, just bring up just God's law in general and how, how great of a thing it would be if, if, for any country to be instituting God's laws and just be like, you know what, we're a nation of the Lord. We're a nation that serves Jesus Christ. We're a nation that, know, that says that we believe God's word to be true and we are going to follow these laws as closely as possible. When it comes to false witnesses, though, I'll read this for you. You're probably familiar with the passage. I preached on this about two week, one or two weeks ago. In Proverbs chapter 6, it talks about things that God hates. He hates a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Verse number 19 says, A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. God hates the false witness. What's a false witness? Someone who's bearing witness saying, Hey, I saw this, or I know this to be true and they're lying about it. It's false. That's what a false witness is. 
The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 9, A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. God, again, God takes this very serious. It's not just, oh, no harm, no foul when, you, when, you're, when you're bearing false witness against somebody. You actually are hurting someone. You're damaging the person you're lying about. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, 18, A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul and a sword and a sharp arrow. I was equating that with, with a weapon of destruction, right? So you may not be physically shooting an arrow at somebody, but when you're bearing false witness, that's exactly what you're doing. It's the same intent to hurt or to kill that person. So let's see how God's perfect law deals with the false witness. Look at verse number 16 in Deuteronomy 19. The Bible says, if a, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong... Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witnesses be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. Amen. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eyes shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. This is the righteous law of God. And I don't know what happened in, in this country especially, because it was, this country was founded on biblical principles. I don't care what anybody says. That's true. All you have to do is go back and look at the laws in history. I've done this multiple times. I think it's fascinating to see, you know, and I'm talking going back to like the colonies. Back when like when believers fled Europe because of their persecution over there and came to a new land to start fresh and to start new and to kind of start a godly country. And there's so many people here that, that were fleeing the persecution because they were believers in the Bible that instituted laws that just matched God's word. And you could find, you, I mean, it's historical fact. You could look it up. And even on perjury, it was the exact same thing. That, and that's what we call today, right, perjury. Now, perjury punishments in America have changed, just like the rest of the, the crimes. These days, you know, it's different for each state. But if it's a federal case, the, the crime for perjury is a fine and or up, and or up to five years in prison. That's it. Federal case. Doesn't matter what the perjury, I mean, it matters, but only up to those amounts. Fine, up to five years in prison. So, and you could, and there's, there are times you have federal cases of, of murder and things like that. Well, if someone commits perjury and just get, brings a false witness against someone that would be put to death under federal law, they could only face a maximum of five years in, in a fine. How wicked is that? See, we need laws like this. I, we were watching, I was watching a documentary with my wife and um, it was like a death row documentary and they were talking to people and as we were watching, you know, some of these stories could be kind of interesting and, you, you know, it, so you, you could, it could expose some corruption in different areas where people kind of Get, get some people just kind of henpecked and, and they, they're evil themselves and they want to, you know, put blame on someone. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. But of course, the liberals that, that hate the death penalty and just want to have the death penalty abolished and say there should never be a death penalty, they're going to want to find those and promote it. And then, you know, so as we were watching one of these things, one of these documentaries, I noticed it was, um, it was, directed or organized or whatever from, from some liberal, some Hollywood liberal person. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, you know. And then, and then the, the wheels are turning. Like, well, that's exactly what they're doing. They're just, the reason why they came out with this was to try, is to try to sway public opinion away from having any death penalty ever. So they want to highlight a few of these examples. But in their examples, there were these cases where you had people that were committing perjury. And I was thinking, well, that's the problem. The problem's not with the death penalty as a whole. See, there's many aspects to this. The problem is with the people 
who are telling lies to put someone else to death and that they're testifying and saying, yep, I saw that person, he's guilty, he did it, and he didn't do it, well, then you know what you got to do? You got to take that guy that's bearing the false witness and you got to put him in his place. And if that guy was going to face a death penalty for committing that crime, then the person bearing the false witness needs to be put to death. Amen. And you know what that does? That makes people think real long and hard whether or not they want to get up and tell a lie about someone else. Right. You could face the exact same sentencing that that person's going to face. That is, that is the absolute right way to do things. And we need, so, you know, if, if we had that, that would solve so many problems. But no, you, you can look back in history and you'll see, you'll see the crimes, the punishments, way more line up with Scripture than they do today. Now it's even getting hard, you know, there's like no punishment for things that the Bible calls death penalty. Like adultery. I mean, what's the, what's the punishment for adultery? I don't think there is one. They may be on law books somewhere in some state, but nobody's enforcing it. Turn forward to Exodus chapter 23. We're going to look at a few more references here about bearing false witness. Because it's, it's really wicked. Telling lies, and especially lying about people, you know, like a... a you can lie about different things that may in and of itself be, uh, you know, call it harmless or, or inconsequential, right? Um, and I'm not just talking about just not remembering something, but if I were to, if I were to just tell you like, hey, I've got, a, I've got a red car, and I don't have a red car, I mean, I'm, I'm lying to you, but what is the real consequence of that? It's not that big of a deal. And that wouldn't have any, you know, I mean, there's no, there would be no punishment associated with because there's not a crime to, to, to say that, right? But lying, I mean, lying itself is still a sin. I shouldn't do that. But when you bear a false witness and say, yeah, I saw this person do that. I saw this person do this thing or that thing or uh, you, you had that happen to you. You had someone bear w false witness and how much, of that, how much of your life did that screw up at flight school because someone lied, someone called up anonymously, right? It, was it the mouth of two or three witnesses? No, it was some anonymous phone call lying about him and just totally screwing up his life, cost him, I don't know how many thousands of dollars as a result of this, just oh, this whole chain of events as a result of one false witness. That is a maul, that is an arrow, that is a sword. And that person ought to be punished. But no, can they even be punished? Well, it's an anonymous tip. We don't know who did it. They just called up and lied about someone else and caused a huge chain of, chain of events to result as, from a lie because they were just bitter against him and hated him and, and wanted to just cause problems in his life. That's wicked. We shouldn't be allowed. Oh, no, but we should have all this anonymous tips so that way people can be caught. No, that, what that is is just opening up the door for people to just be really wicked and bear false witness without having any consequence, any blame. I thought we lived in a country where you could face your accusers. I mean, again, that's what it was founded on, on that principle. It's wickedness. Exodus 23, look at verse number 1. Another admonition here, not to get caught up with a multitude of people that bear false witness. Look at verse number one. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. Rest is like perverted or twisted and I think this is all the more important in the social media age that we live in. There are false witnesses that I'm sure abound on the internet. We ought not to just jump on bandwagons and start accusing people where we don't know anything about the situation. Now, if someone makes an accusation and they have evidence, fine. 
right? But you better be very careful, especially with what the Bible talks about here with false witnesses and the way God views it. And I don't care if we live in a world that you might never get caught, you might never get punished by our system because God sees everything. Be careful who you go around and just making accusations about that you don't know anything about. Because if it's false, Whatever your accusation is, that deserves to be brought back upon your own head. And you know who rights wrongs? You know who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord? The one who sees everything. So when the government's not doing its job, you better be sure, and especially if you're a believer, you better be sure that God will Bring back on your own head what you deserve if you go around and just start spreading lies and rumors and bearing false witness against people. Don't get caught up with that. If you have knowledge of something, that's one thing, but be care just be careful with it is what I'm saying. If you hear someone that you trust give a testimony... You can take that into consideration, but I, I wouldn't be so bold as to then just use that to bring an accusation against somebody because you don't know firsthand. Turn, if you would, to um, 1 Timothy chapter 5. You see in the Old Testament all you know these laws about dealing with false pro or false witnesses, and um, and the way that the government ought to handle that. But sometimes even in church you'll get you'll get accusations. Now not every accusation is false, but obviously and and you know this should go without stating. But I like to try to make mention of this anytime I'm preaching on the law because. People will try to spin my words or, or say that I'm teaching that we should be vigilantes and go out and just execute all of God's judgment because, well, that's what they believe. You believe it should be with the death. So what are you going to do? You go out there and kill all these homos? Or you, kill, you know, like, no, we don't believe that here. We believe that, like the Bible says, God's instituting what the civil government should be and how the law should be enacted and who it is that's supposed to be carrying out these sentences. And it's not for the church to do that, which is also why we see an example of the church in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and accusations being brought forward and how it's dealt with inside a church. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. So it doesn't say you could never have an accusation against an elder. I mean, that would be ridiculous. You can't just have a man just in some position where they could never be accused of anything. But it is very, very serious that he says, okay, well, if someone's going to make an accusation against the elder of the church, it needs to be done in a manner where we could have a couple witnesses that they could hear every word and every word could be established and people could say, yep, this is what the accusation is. You know, and then, and then proceed further from there. But notice what it says here, though. Verse number 20, it says, Them that sin rebuke before all. So, against, and, 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 you know, as with everything, you need to have more than just one witness. Because one witness cannot do, does not have power to inflict any type of a, of a punishment upon anybody. There needs to be at least one other person and, and their, their witnesses have to agree together. Otherwise, it holds no weight. Otherwise, you, I mean, there's no way of telling if that person's even lying or not. It's not enough evidence. But what I'm, what I'm pointing out here in verse number 20, it says, them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. I believe this is referring to people who are bringing false accusations against the elder. Because look, if an elder is guilty of, of something, of an accusation, then he, singular, would be, you know, I mean, would need to be punished or dealt with appropriately. But this is saying, them that sin, rebuke before all that others also may fear. So if someone's bringing up a false, you know, if you've got a couple witnesses bring up false accusations against an elder, 
You do that before witnesses, and then diligent inquisition ought to be made, as we saw in Deuteronomy, that, that you know, they need to inquire about this. They need to make sure, get down to the heart, of, you know, the, the truth of the matter. And if these people are, are lying and bringing up false accusations against the elder, then you do it publicly and make sure that these guys are going to be ashamed and make sure anyone else that wants to try to bring up their false accusations is going to hear and they're going to fear. And they're not going to be tempted to come up with their own false accusations. But that's within the church. Notice, within the church, it's not saying that they're going to receive the same exact punishment that the law would give them. This is how you deal with it within the church, and that's how we would deal with things. Obviously, it's not the same. We don't have, the author we don't have God given authority that God has given to civil government within the church. It's a different, it's a different scope. Turn, if you would, to um, Matthew chapter 5. It's kind of my, my final point. I just want to wrap up with this. Don't be surprised if you are witnessed against falsely when serving God. Don't let that shock you. Paul says, Yea, and all that will give godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We know that false witnesses is, is definitely one way that the devil likes to attack. The, the, um, remember with Ahab? And Jezebel and um, Naboth's vineyard, right? He, they, they, pay, they paid the, the wicked children of, of Belial, of Baal, the, the, the Satan worshipers. They, they paid them to just, to just wear, or they told them to. I don't know if they even paid them. They just told them to, to bring up a false witness against Naboth and had him killed just so they could steal his vineyard. He didn't do anything wrong. He was righteous. He was saying, no, I'm not going to give this to you. This is my inheritance from the Lord. This is, you know, I, I can't do that. He was, he was being righteous in the sight of God. He was following what's right, but he was lied against. Jesus Christ, of course, was lied against. I'm going to read Matthew 26, 59. It says, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many witness, false witnesses came, yet found they none at the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple and to build it in three days. They couldn't find two witnesses that agreed together because they're all false. And if they're, they're seeking, they're just like, come on, someone just tell us. You know, it's like, they're probably willing to just feed them the answer and just be like, just tell us this so we can go and kill this man. They knew they're false witnesses, but they just kept on searching. Just someone come to us. And then what, what do they finally get? Someone that bears witness of something that's not even a crime. Is it, is it a crime to say, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days? Is that, is that some crime? I don't remember that being a crime in Roman law or in, in, in God's law to say I'm able to do something like that. That's not a crime. And that's all they were able to get against Jesus Christ. But they didn't care, obviously. They, they were just bent on putting him to death anyways because they're a bunch of wicked people. But... Um, you know, that's, that's the way they dealt with Jesus. They were constantly looking to kill him. They were, they were seeking false witnesses. And you, you find that throughout Scripture, that people will be lied about. Especially when you're doing right. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 10. The Bible says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Look at this. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. So what's that talking about? Someone bearing false witness against you. When they're saying, you did something evil. You did something wrong. Oh, you know, Pastor Burson, do you know that he did this and he did that and just some false accusation? But the Bible says, hey, you're blessed. And you know why you're blessed? It says, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. God's people, people who are doing something for the Lord like the prophets, who are standing up and making a difference and preaching the truth. That's nothing new. People are always going to be spreading their false reports and false witnesses. And as I mentioned earlier, especially with the internet, look at the YouTube comments. Look at the Facebook comments. Look at, look at the social media comments, wherever it may be. And you see the people just throwing out their, their baseless accusations especially against Pastor Anderson, against others, just, oh man, this person did this, this person. Don't, don't buy into that, first of all. I mean, just someone writes some YouTube comment. 
some one witness just saying, oh, I knew this person back in Bible college. I knew this. You know, it's like not even true. Like they don't even know where they came from and they're just making stuff up. But some random person out there looking will, you know, maybe not know any better and, and believe them. But, and that's the whole point is they're trying to just, just destroy the work of God with, through their lies. But the truth always stands above the lies. But don't, don't be, you know, not only don't be surprised when it happens, you can actually rejoice. Your first instinct is going to be to get kind of angry and maybe want to respond and want to just tell all these people and clear your name or whatever. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to. Did Jesus try to clear his name when they're bringing up all these false accusations? He didn't say a word. He just continued along about his father's business. We don't need to answer these things. And we don't even need to let it bother us. In fact, you can just be happy. Be happy for this because no matter what problems it causes in your life now, no matter what hardship or, or, or money or whatever it costs you as a result of someone bearing false witness, you get to rejoice because great is your reward in heaven. Hey, praise the Lord that someone, you know, bear false witness against me and cause me all kinds of grief and persecution and suffering because especially if it's something I would have gained physically in this earth, but now instead I've gained something in heaven. Yeah, I'll make, I'll make that trade any day. I lost a thousand bucks, but I got, you know, a thousand eternal rewards in heaven. Okay. I'll give you all my money. Here, take it. <laughs> whatever, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. It's irritating in the short term, but don't let it get to you. Look at verse number 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. We should be open about what we believe. We should be open about preaching the truth. We should be doing this. God's called us to do this. Say, hey, you've got a light. You've got to let it shine. And the reason why he's bringing this up right after talking about being persecuted is because he doesn't want that to get you to shut up. Don't let these liars and deceivers and evil workers stop you from doing what you're called to do. Don't let them put the bushel over the, over the lamp. Don't let them cause you to just be afraid now and stop. You're the salt of the earth. You need to do some preserving. You need to, you need to get out there and, and just keep spreading that word. Yeah, it's not fun dealing with a false witness, but God will take care of that too. We don't need to worry about that. The Bible says in Psalm 27, 12, Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. It's wicked false witnesses, that br they breathe out cruelty. It says, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. And this is admonition. You know, these, these false witnesses... They breathe out cruelty, but you just wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Tribulation worketh patience. Don't jump to taking matters into your own hands. Trust in God's law. Trust in God's word. Trust that God will make things right and that you can actually rejoice and say, fine, I'm being persecuted because of my beliefs. I'm being persecuted because I'm standing on God's word. Then I'm going to rejoice. And these liars are just going to keep on lying. And if we had a righteous government, the liars would be put, you know, given the, the, the same punishment that they thought to bring on the other person. But we don't. But whenever there's conversations that come up about politics or laws or whatever, you know, we ought to know God's law. So then you can be, make an educated argument and say, well, this is what the laws ought to be. This is what we ought to be doing with people. Why? Because God said so. I don't care what your philosophy of man says. I don't care what your 
political philosophy of whatever, whether it's libertarian or communist or socialist or whatever, I don't care what your platform says because we know what God said. You think you've got the best way. You think you've got your non-aggression principle that can't ever be violated. And that's why we can't put homos to death because they should just be able to do whatever they want. No, God said it's a crime. And that deserves a death penalty because they're perverted, they're wicked, and they defile people, they're reprobate, and they just need to be put down. Amen. But that's the truth. And it, whether or not it agrees with your political ideology, I don't care. It's your vain tradition of men. God gave us the truth, and we've got it. Let's study it. Let's know God's law. Let's be wise in that regard. And you know, that also will help you to be wise among who you, who you choose to be around. Maybe you're reading in here and you see some stuff and it's like, wow, that's that wicked, that that deserves a death penalty. May, you know, I, I, God forbid you know someone, but maybe you know someone who's, you know, laying with a, a woman and her mother or something, you know, like the Bible's saying here, it's just, just, I'm not going to have anything to do with that person. That's just weird. That's perverted. Someone that, you know, Learn God's laws don't, and don't be desensitized by this wicked world and let that alter your perception and the seriousness or the gravity of these various crimes because they are that serious. Kidnapping is that serious. Rapist is that serious. Adultery is that serious. Cursing your father or mother is that serious. God's perfect word. Spar Reds have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you please help us to just be bold and stand on your words and uh, understand them and, and be able to apply them in our life as appropriate. Lord, help us to not be desensitized to sin, especially these wicked sins, and that we would um, just be able to deal with them appropriately to, in, in the way that we teach our children and um, the way that we live our lives, Lord, and pray that you will please just help us to not be discouraged when false witnesses do arise. Help us to uh, stay on the right path and to not cover the light that you've given us to shine, that we would continue to do your work and to, and to shine and to spread the truth no matter what the, the human consequences may be here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.